Hello everyone, today another chapter of medieval German history and in particular post Hohenstaufen Germany, which obviously doesn't mean that we have to tell the whole story uh, of Germany after the Hohenstaufen up to today, but um, roughly, you know, um, talking about the consequences that the end of the, the Hohenstaufen dynasty had in the institutional um, <coughs> and also broadly, more broadly political um, and social development of um, especially the German kingdom, tone and truth, because you know when we talk about Holy Roman Empire, we we are practically talking about something larger, including Italy, Germany, Bohemia, um <coughs> also other uh, parts of uh, you know that, that really do not. Um, telling the truth uh, overlap with the um, with the modern national borders of these countries, um, and uh, so this is gonna uh, stick essentially to the story of the German kingdom. Um, as probably uh, you know, I already made uh, videos about the Hohenstaufen history, and generally speaking, talking about this <coughs> phase of transition that. They uh, that uh, uh, in German history that that was in many ways already existing before the same rise of the Hohenstaufen dynasty and has to do with the um, original um, institutional um, system of the German kingdom. So this elective monarchy that <coughs> at a certain point was um, in fact during the same Hohenstaufen basically. Um, um, and partly telling the truth because it wasn't so direct. It was also Otto of Brunswick in the middle uh, was uh, being tried to be transformed into a dynastic monarchy and in, into a um, national monarchy uh, of the German lands. <coughs> so um, if you want to give, uh, want to have a bit more of context, go look at the videos I made about uh, in the playlist Medieval Germany that contains that. Um, so we're not really talking about the Hohenstaufen here, but really what happened immediately after them. Or maybe, you know, the w sometimes we think, you know, the, the Hohenstaufen ended with the death of Frederick II. Well, they didn't. <laughs> as a matter of fact, they lived on. There was Conrad IV as uh, king of Germany. Then eventually there was also the, uh, the story of Conradin and uh, the relation, you know, the, the failed attempt of recovering the, uh, the Sicilian heritage of, of the Swabians from the, uh, at that time, already the Angevin hands uh, that had seized um, the, the Kingdom of Sicily. <coughs> uh, but, um, and, and we shouldn't emphasize, in fact, too much the, um, you know, the shock of the end of the di uh, of the Hohenstaufen, because um, we, we tend to, I personally love the Hohenstaufen, I have a great passion towards this dynasty, but I recognize that indeed uh, telling the story uh, as if, you know, the end of the Hohenstaufen uh, left to a vacuum of complete um, chaos into Germany is, is not um, quite correct uh, historically either and and we can say that generally speaking for instance during the same <coughs> reign of Frederick II Germany had been relatively left uh, a bit on its own um, from Frederick in the sense that he had a Mediterranean policy and he, he actually cared about his German uh, his German um, uh, ancestry and mm, tradition, and even the role of of uh, of, of uh, German king, and um, but uh, he he was with his mind he was elsewhere, and um, and many of the um, uh, of the in in increasement of in the power of the <coughs> uh, German princes to you know, to, I can't say the, the active detrition, but definitely to the weakening of the monarchic central authority was uh, started even during Frederick II himself. Um, without mentioning that, generally speaking, when we talk about the Hohenstaufen, we, um, <coughs> we are talking, as, m as many other times in history, of uh, very powerful dynasties that 
um, were quite powerful, m m most likely because they had a very, mm, they had very huge domains and even um <coughs> an influence over uh, over an exceptionally mm, based uh, territory. But mm, quite often they they kind of ha they, they 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 could afford that because they had risen from that same homos and background <coughs> that uh, um, um, a very different um, political culture entailed, meaning that uh, even the Hohenstaufen kind of had dynastic interests um, relatively detached from the strictly uh, cen um, s uh, centralizing ones uh, in many ways. Um, you can argue that the same Hohenstaufen brought into Germany um <coughs> um uh, an increase to uh decentralization uh through the introduction of feudalism that tell me truth is a bit more complicated than this because feudalism at that time as a political model would be um um a cent um, I, I can't say a centralizing but definitely a unifying factor a gluing factor politically speaking which is paradoxical but it is true and especially in the german case and and in fact what i, I want to stress today relatively to the post and Stalfen period is how in spite of all in spite of the uh, rise of, um, of feudalism and in the um, weakening of central authority and in, in sort of privatization of public institutions in Germany. Overall, Germany <coughs> kind of worked out in some ways. Very disorderly, um, probably wi with a great dispersion of forces, but hey, you know, the Germans have never been invaded at that point. The German um, Civilization kind of flourished. Uh, you you can say the same for Italy, for instance, that it has a very different, um, <coughs> very different characteristics, but essentially was the, um, at a point extremely fragmented, like the same Germany. So you find that these um, imperial lands uh, at, at the uh, thresholds uh, of the um, of the modern age were the most advanced uh, countries in the world. So <coughs> there is something that has to be explained. Uh, you can't just talk about crisis, you can't just talk about weakening, and you have to recognize that overall uh, what was achieved in Germany as uh, essentially a, fe um, a federation mm, institutionally mindful of the rights of the local political entities was was a pretty amazing feat, um, and, um, um, and 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 it's essentially you know, something very advanced, even in political theory for those times standards. You know, uh, it is not bad. Uh, feder uh, federative thinking had in Germany uh, and still has, indeed, a uh, huge uh, importance. It's, it's kind of it, it's much more than a political system. It's really the expression of a certain culture, a certain political cult culture and civilization broadly meant. But today, however, in, in more prosaic terms, we will be seeing how the whole thing had happened, and obviously, we won't <laughs> escape uh, much criticism towards you know the, the what happened in Germany because of the end of the Hohenstaufen dynasty, and what chances were missed also by certain monarchs that. In, in practice could still do something um, in, in centralizing um, uh, towards a centralizing direction after the end of the Oenstaufen. So as I was saying, um, um, let's say roughly from the mid of the 13th century, the, uh, the Kingdom of Germany was essentially um, and constitutionally um, uh, a very mm, floating and fluid federation of, um, of mm, uh, mm, we, we might say of princes, some, um, I read sometimes uh, states, because um, especially in English, um, in, in the Anglosphere, the concept of state, the word, mm, the term state is, uh, I think not wrongly, uh, used to define you know every kind of political organization of sorts you mm, obviously 
uh, the German Federation at this point was made up of mostly princely powers, but overall these princes had their own states in many ways, also because they often encompassed uh, a very diverse, uh, a very diversified um, group of communities that could be either either other feudal lords or cities or um, ecclesiastical um <coughs> centers, etc. So. Um, there was a lot of heterogeneity, and state might be, I think, uh, uh, used with some efficacy in, in the description of this system. And, um, and this federation obviously ha was still part uh, of an empire, of a kingdom, so that um, the, um, uh, an institution that was um, in many ways the pride of the Germans at that time. Also in here, sometimes historiographically we find stressed the fact that, you know, that at this point uh, there is uh, the formal sanction, especially in, in <coughs> with the peak, uh, you know, of um, marked by the Golden Bull of 1356, uh, so one, one century after of, um, of the elective monarchy of Germany. Um, as if the emperors were chosen because they were weak only. Uh, this is not really true, and I'll tell you that, um, telling the truth, this could be truer in, in previous moments of German history rather than in these, because, um, <coughs> um, yeah, there wasn't a central power, b and but the the election, exactly because of the political fragmentation that followed the end of the Ohnstaufen, was extremely ferocious in many ways. So uh, even the electors that uh, contended um, this uh, the, the imperial crown uh, were actually quite um, you know qu quite quite aggressive powers, powers that that maybe had narrow bases but could still achieve um, something greater uh, in a short time if it, if there hadn't been this balance of of the various princely uh, houses that tried to stem that. So, if you really look at German history in this period, what you see, uh, telling the truth, is a, um, is a great fluctuation of the same imperial authority in strength. And in the Habsburgs, especially uh, at, at the end of the uh, 13th and the very beginning of the 14th century, were a very big force. Uh, also for German standards, even for Ohnstaufen standards, obviously less than them, but they were uh, they had been capable of gaining immediately a huge amount of power that just uh, ev after this was uh, resized. But at that moment, uh, it wasn't probably even perceived <coughs> that um, the decline had to be steady and continued. Uh, maybe someone else could rise at a point. Um, and um, we also sometimes don't conceive the Bohemian crown. The Bohemian crown in, in, the, thir in the second half of the 13th century had a huge power within Germany. Um, it could be a sort of new, uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the one of the premises could really <coughs> become something very big uh, that uh, could expand in Germany, but was deeply rooted also into um, part of this uh, Western Slavic world. Um, it had achieved a, a huge power that eventually was crushed by the Habsburgs at, ba at the Battle of Markfeld. But, um, you know, there were at some point certain powers which theoretically had the potential to achieve something and they failed for, for certain certain quite unfortunate circumstances, telling the truth. Um, we won't be discussing them now, but just to give you this different perspective that um, things could really go in another, uh, in another way compared to what they did. Um, uh, and there is also another important element of this story that is essentially the subtraction in this period of the um, influences on the German um <coughs> imperial uh, election um, from the Pope. Um, meaning what, really? That it's not that the Pope um, ceased to have effective influence over the election of the uh, German emperors, but the, um <coughs> the choice of 
of these um, emperors would be with the shrinking of the same um, uh, international influence of the empire much more tied to the actual um, local German situation rather than the international one. So um, in, in proportion um, even if <laughs> the German crown had lost power um, it, it had gained an, uh, a more German nature. Mm. Um, this was something that uh, probably the same German princes stressed uh, in a certain sense, and the same German emperors from this point onwards did, because um, if you see Frederick II, that was the uh, arguably the acme of the uh, Holy Roman Imperial power. I personally believe it was under Frederick I, but <coughs> and let's say it was the acme, at least from an ideological point of view, in the sense that Frederick II was not a German uh, uh, ruler. He was a Roman emperor, point. And he, he was, um, you know, he, he conceived himself as the hypothesis of, an, of, of the immortal idea of the Roman emperor, which is what you can find even in, in the fashion he, was he made him himself represented in front of the subjects, etc. So it was a truly a national universal emperor. <coughs> when you s what you see when um, Rodolf of Habsburg raises uh, in the mm, comes to the throne, now we will be s discussing this, but let's say that Rodolf of Habsburg, Rudolf the first was um, conceived the, the first effective ruler after Frederick the second compared to the other ones that had existed in the meanwhile. And uh, if you look at this um, um, uh, gravestone in the dome of Speyer in southern Germany, what you see is that his face, his, uh, you know, his appearances as he had himself mm, represented on the grave were the ones of a German prince. Um, he was naturalistically represented for the first time in imperial history, uh, he was uh, he was not a Roman emperor. He was Rudolf of Habsburg, a kingdom of Romans, of course, but also Count of Habsburg, um, uh, Duke of Austria, uh, etc. So um, there was, um, I think, a sense of pride uh, in the recognition of the actual mm, political situation by the uh, the same German powers at this point. Um, <coughs> and not by chance, this is a moment in which also the uh, the Germans kind of um, get increasingly less involved in in politics that uh, went beyond the German borders. Uh, for instance, the expeditions to Italy that had r basically um, been the uh, the must do of every um, German monarch uh, were <coughs> came increasingly, you know, to be increasingly weaker. Only Henry the Seventh managed to, to to do something substantially in the, in the trace of, of his predecessors, but it was um, already a much different thing. Um, and therefore, the Germans began to to think more German than they had. Um, and you can argue that, in fact, the own self and and those um, previous dynasties uh, that had come on the imperial throne had been, um, mm, let's say, relatively much more conscious of their international prestige. Um, at this point, is that, and while the rest of the German nobility would be very much hostile to the expansion, for, for instance, the, the German nobility never actually liked to go south of the Alps in for military expeditions. They, they didn't care. Uh, n and <coughs> completely understandably, because uh, they, uh, they they didn't want to spend money to go conquering some lands in Italy for the emperor that eventually they would neither get a part of it, that they were a mess because they were in continuous revolt, etc. They preferred to develop their own, um, you know, th their interests, they, their expansion into Germany proper. So at, at this point, um, in, in from the second half of the 13th century, essentially uh, even the imperial, um, <coughs> German imperial politics uh, kind of shrinks and is remodeled around essentially the German perspective, mm. um, which was 
by the way, uh, quite large in itself. You know, if you look at this map, for instance, it's pretty. You know, besides the the, the the first thing that comes to the eye, that is the, the the high degree of fragmentation of political power that neither the Italians had at this time, so 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 marked. Uh, you still see that that Germany, uh, uh, especially with borders of that time, was a pretty pretty large area. Mm, it expanded also in here in the northeast, where, where in the Baltic Sea. Um, there were, you know, <laughs> they 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 had uh, enough realm <laughs> to to have fun with, you know, the realm mid space in Germ uh, in Germany, and uh, it was propagandistically, you know, even during Nazi Germany, you know, it was this idea of realm like the expansion of the German people. Huh? Uh, the Germans were still expanding at this point with towards the east. Um, and and that was, for instance, a more profitable direction uh, for many German nobles um, <coughs> than 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 other directions like towards France or towards Italy. Um, uh, even though everyone really played in the in its own environment, like the for instance the the South uh, Germans were quite, especially the one of the Southeast were quite happy to interfere in Italian affairs. Uh, the German powers of the West did interfere, including the Habsburgs into the French m uh, or uh, Savoy's matter. S um, so yeah, th they kind of um, re resized their ambitions according to their regional their regional interests. Um, and uh, as you can see from the map, obviously these expansions were extremely complicated because, you know, mm, there is apparently no, um, obviously there is no um, territorial unity in here. You know, the biggest things you see here uh, extensively are the Kingdom of Bohemia, not surprisingly, the uh, the Habsburgic lands uh, here that they had conquered in block in one shot, um, the <coughs> Margrave, uh, um, the Markgrafschaft, let's say it, the, the German way of, of Brandenburg. Um, here you find the Herzogtum Braunschweig, Brabant also is kind of large and uh, some ecclesiastical domain, but generally speaking uh, it's still a very messy situation. Also, Bava ba Bayern here, Bavaria, etc. And there were other powers on the rise. Think about the Swiss. Uh, well, well, but uh, for now, let's stick to our <laughs> our s um, our paper. So, um, the uh, sometimes on in um, well probably all the times that you s study the history of Germany between 1250 and 1273, you will find that this period is called the Interregnum. Mm. So um, a word that, a Latin word that, that is used to, to define a moment between two reigns. Um, <coughs> and this is um, 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 essentially the period that, that stands between the death of Frederick II and the um, the election to king of, of the Romans, not not Holy Roman Emperor, which he never became, actually, of Rudolf uh, I of Habsburg. Uh, now, many people from this believe that um, practically during this period there were no um, no rulers in Germany, but this is not true. Actually, there were, but in in German historiography, they are called the um, if I'm not wrong, the machtlösige uh, Könige, which basic basically means the uh, powerless um, kings, um, because indeed they were very weak figures. They were uh, Henry uh, um, Raspe or William of Holland, Richard of Cornwall, uh, Al even Alfonso of Castile, that were elected at a point by the German nobility as um, these ones really, yeah, very weak rulers. Um, you can understand that here you have an English, like an Englishman like Richard of Cornwall or a Spanish uh, sovereign like Alfonso of Castile. That, <coughs> that especially Alfonso was, was quite of a monarch in his own land. 
um, and that for dynastic reasons had come to 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 have ambitions in Germany, but obviously they they couldn't intervene in Germany. It was a highly Alfonso of Castile was generally true very much in love with the idea of universalism, so which the um, Holy Roman Imperial Crown implied. So there is a lot in this 13th century that still revolves uh, around the idea of having um, a unique sovereign, at least in Western Europe. Um, actually, ac in the East, because at this time <coughs> the Byzantine Empire lands had been conquered by Western Crusaders. Um, and after all, 13th century is a bit the peak of universalism, but this is already in the descending uh, phase. Um, and um and it's it's in this moment actually that the worst damages were were done um there were also um i i forgot to name um also Conrad the fort that i named at the beginning of the video there was the the last one and stuff and at this point um uh, who, who had already been king of germany under his father from 1237 um, but he wasn't also a, a great, um, you know, a, a very powerful ruler uh, in his own way. But just for telling that the transition towards uh, the post and Stalin period didn't actually, w was a longer thing than one normally thinks. However, this is, uh, as I was saying, the moment in which there was more damage, because essentially the, the imperial, um, there were no emperors, and the uh, monarchic power was extremely weak. So at this point you have to think that all the powers that existed in Germany as lords, cities, mm, bishops, etc. became to expand as much as they could by essentially um, 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 m m you know without control and especially by um, <coughs> Uh, usurpating the uh, imperial rights that existed in, in, in the kingdom. Imperial rights mean not something theoretical like it was something you can find in the constitution, these are my rights. When we talk about rights in this uh, context we're talking about the actual sources of revenue of the imperial crown. So this means that uh, the, mm, there were certain um, <coughs> statal properties that at this point remained without uh, a ruler uh, using and protecting them and that are occupied by, by other powers. And this was the, uh, the, um, the, the very moment in which the German monarchy uh, uh, was bleeded wide um, and, uh, y the, um, and, 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 and about which um, the, the following rulers couldn't really do much because the situation in which they had been resized through this process uh, simply made them lack the resources to, to claim those rights back. Um, <coughs> so, um, and, and, and this, however, uh, triggered also a series of political developments within the same communities. Uh, for instance, the 13th century had seen the rise of certain cities in Germany. Um, Germany is a bit differentiated uh, because West, especially Western and Southern Germany are kind of more urbanized areas because they had been under the Roman Empire. Uh, Central nor and, and Northern and Eastern Germany <coughs> not so much. So there are certain areas, um, especially in, in the Rhine Valley famously, that began to uh, s uh, that, that witnessed the rise of certain um, uh, urban leagues mm, not very different from what had happened in Italy, uh, against like uh, the same Lombard League, for instance, that have fought against the Oinstauf, and even uh, if telling the truth, the German cities are are a bit weaker than the Italian ones. They 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 rarely rarely make it to become uh, in fully independent because, especially the, the ecclesiastical power of the bishops was often. Uh, quite strongly rooted in the same cities, so there were a lot of clashes, as it were a lot of, of warfare during the 13th century in Germany was, um, especially in the development of, of infantry, uh, happened um, uh, contextually to these clashes between uh, city and bishop. Mm. Um, but it's important because um, the leagues that are formed 
um, are meant uh, exactly to counter the seigneurial power mm, on the same cities. Uh, and the same tongue trick um, happens uh, even within nobles and sometimes obviously even be um, uh, between nobles and cities so that you know a city wanted to ally with a uh, noble that was a rival of the uh, other noble that were fighting so um, th there is a lot of um, uh, inter you know there, there, there is the, the uh, essentially a, a work from that starts from from the bottom to um, to work out something uh, locally, um, a, a new to create a new authority on a local base, and this was very important in, in the institutional development of of Germany because um, in certain cases these pacts and alliances were institutionally recognized, and even sometimes um, these communities would uh, make pacts in a fashion that was essentially already um, legally recognized. <coughs> Excuse me. For instance, the, the Swiss uh, Confederation that is born at this point um, uh, uh, wasn't really anything like you know, a fight for independence, like you know, the national Swiss you know, historiography of the older times wanted to stress. But on the contrary, it was the um, it, it was a pact uh, contracted, um, which was called Landfried. That was technically the 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 piece of the of the land of the region, that was something uh, recognized uh, institutionally in the empire, and that was promulgated usually by by the imperial authority. Uh, to pacify certain uh, certain certain areas, uh, because obviously, and, and 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 this was a tool that existed in German politics since a very long time. Also, because the German lands had always been quite troubled uh, uh, in local war by local warfare and and stuff like that. Um, and um and, and in certain cases obviously these pacts would be uh, contracted uh, directly with local kings um i mean or not just with local princes as we said before the kings were this time drawn from the same princely uh class that uh, had monopolized the, the election of the imperial uh, election so it could have happened that maybe the, the person you had made a pact with would be elected emperor <laughs> at a certain point. So obviously that would be a quite profitable channel to exploit for you because if you were already in good relation with uh, a guy that became an emperor, he could recognize through his imperial authority now the pacts and the privileges, however, that, that, mm, that you had contracted um, uh, and so on. And, um, and 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 I think the role of cities is quite important because, um, as you know, uh, in in Germany, as you probably know, um, the German uh, there was also another uh, status that a uh, that um, that a urban center could um, could acquire into the um, into the uh, German constitution that was uh, the one of a uh, free city. Um, Freie Reichsstadt uh, in Germany, uh, in German, which means um, free city of the empire, was a title recognized and uh, a, a very used political tool, uh, which the Ohlenstaufen used um, um, quite often, uh, and uh, which uh, which was very clever because sometimes it allowed the um, the rise uh, by imperial order. Um, uh, in protection of certain uh, urban centers within the lands of s of of, uh, of uh, very powerful uh, noblemen who were often in contrast, incidentally and not surprisingly, uh, with uh, with the crown, um, and it was used. and And these cities would grow with some privileges. Differently from Italy, they very rarely. Uh, managed to expand um, into regional powers or even um, in in um, in a district that would surpass a few miles out of the city walls, but they were e extremely important centers, uh, especially from an economical point of view, 
which means that even if you don't have the power you can still buy it uh, through through that economic but at the same time um, we must say that generally speaking in Germany the clash between cities and and, and lords where lay or ecclesiastic was usually won by um, by lords mm -hmm. so but not always and um, and and there is in fact the uh, the uh, at this very moment in German history the uh, the laying of, of of the basis of certain mm, kind of statual entities that revolved around cities or, or yeah um, um, talking now about aristocracy strictly because this is the, the most important player in the picture um, there were um, also within um, within the nobility a great a great variety a great heterogeneity um, first of all um, there was um, essentially um, um, a, a dual division um, in, in um, schematically into the German aristocracy first of all there was the uh, which was a juridical one recognized by the Empire's laws uh, there was first of all the one of um, uh, the high nobility of the uh, historical territorial powers of Germany, like, and we're talking especially about the uh, the great, um, mm, quite often even um, the great electors. So obviously, uh, the king of Bohemia w had certain prerogatives and rights and uh, and jurisdictions that they are nobility <laughs> couldn't reach because it was a, a kingdom within the same uh, Holy Roman Empire but even the uh, the Markgraf of Brandenburg or the var think about the um, um, the archbishoprics of Trier, Mainz and Co uh, Cologne uh, think about the, the Habsburgs so these very th these were very big um, um, princes that were the the upper level mm, the, um, and 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 they 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 grew increasingly at the upper level because um, they were uh, at this time they, they were essentially making um, by competing with each other they were automatically however recognizing each other a certain authority and prestige as major political players that would be sanctioned eventually by the golden bull um, and that went in parallel with the strengthening of their own power and the certification of the German society. Mm -hmm. um, from the other side is that there was a, a the, the, the lesser aristocracy um, that was often um, uh, th that was in turn divided in two um, because the minor aristocracy of Germany was um, it could be aristocracy of blood so it could be certain um, um territorial um um you know oh, there were obviously families that hadn't make it to become extremely powerful like others so um but this seemed to, to have been the minority so the the old families of blood of germany of, of true nobility by the way but then there was a, a, a kivalric nobility um that was the one of ministerial origin that was originally speaking uh, not even nobility proper as a matter of fact they were a class of serfs the ministeriales uh, rose as administrators of local um, uh, of the German nobility back in the day the first um, I think the first um, historical knowledge we have of them is from the time of the, impe the Emperor Conrad II so very very early in time but at this point, especially in the 13th century, they had, first of all, usually grown in number, but especially they had, uh, even more especially, um, a rise and to essentially the same level of the rest of the, of the um, minor aristocracy, um, becoming essentially equal to it. And telling the truth, some ministeriales um, of... Uh, um, therefore, uh, of servile origin, had made a huge fortune und under the Hohenstaufen, 
we were trying in this way through them to contrast the the uh, the nobility of, of blood and and the Wu had become in large part even richer wealthier more powerful also in military revenues and in political um uh power than um than the other nobility and and these were present um especially in southern Germany, into the lands that the Swabians had uh, tried to make as, in fact, as, as their core base of power. Um, in places like Austria, for instance, we know that there were like 90% uh, numerically of the total of the noblemen existing. So, w especially in those areas, they were kind of the effective rulers of, of the land. Uh, so um, they had a great power and this is the moment in which um, telling the truth by the 14th century um, as far as I know um, the differentiation between uh, ministeriales and the rest of the nobility came to vanish uh, juridically and they uh, and this tells you also by the way how you know politics was made uh, in the sense that nobody cared what was your juridical status uh, originally speaking within the the, the German um, you know the German uh, society but the important is that you were noble and you, you had power and that you could be uh, um, uh, you know considered as a valid political player mm. but it, even the juridical differences basically uh, get forgotten or they're simply not even taken anymore into consideration um, <coughs> and um, the mm, and, and, and this lesser nobility usually was obviously um, framed under uh, within the 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 um, the, the, the domains uh, of the um, of the higher nobility mm -hmm. so obviously there would be like like for the Habsburgs, uh, when they settled in Austria, they kind of inherited all these ministeriales that existed there. So uh, this lesser aristocracy was often the backbone of the military uh, of the um, German uh, princes. So um, they were quite skilled um, military men, uh, professional uh, elite, like the, the feudal one was at the time. Um, the 13th century sees basically the, the full feudalization of Germany. You know that feudalism had been imported from from France. Uh, I mean, th the French model of feudalism, at least, uh, from France during the uh, the 12th century. So, um, um, after one century, Germany could claim to be essentially a, a feudal uh, nation uh, also and especially in terms of military culture in the development of a uh, heavy cavalry and courtly values and all this stuff um, and uh, tournaments th there are uh, this is also in German literature the 13th century is fantastic there are there is a huge production of uh, epics, of chronicles, you know, all inspired to the old German epics and the French um, uh, literary models. I mean, um, <laughs> we could talk for hours really about all these things. Um, but um, for now, um, uh, what I want to remember is that the um, in, in, into the, the between the 13th and 14th century the new um, German system uh, began to recognize certain social classes within uh, the institutional frame of the uh, of the kingdom um, these were called uh, essentially orders stände uh, in, in in German and, um, and and they could be uh, either the um, the the cities the uh, the ministerial uh, the ministerial uh, knights uh, the uh, the clergy mm. that uh, made mass the made body they had a political rep re uh, uh, representance and it was in fact uh, defined institutionally so um, uh, this was not a unitary process meaning that uh, even if there were imperial diets that were essentially the imperial parliaments uh, called um, uh, 
um, sometimes uh, not with the participation of the wall mm, representatives of the uh, Stände. Um, telling the truth, this the recognizing of the same Stände uh, passed mostly from the local uh, rights. That is, it's not that at a certain point the empire recognized, you know, the uh, the German knights as a stand. Uh, this came after that in the vari all the various uh, territories, all with their times and uh, uh, and, um, and 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 pe and peculiar, you know, uh, dynamics had kind of recognized that, and eventually that was brought at the higher level and and recognized uh, institutionally. And and this dishomogeneity is actually reflected also in the fact that these um, Stände were not really much solidal um, <laughs> within uh, within themselves, meaning that um, um, you know the um, within the same order there could be a lot of uh, of, co of competition of in many ways, uh, not just a competition between, uh, for instance, the the high the princes and the stands who obviously claimed their own prerogatives in front of the princes that obviously weren't much happy of that because that meant that within their own domains there would be someone claiming mm, actual prerogatives um to use politically but also within this I these groups who were quite heterogeneous uh it was a lot of infight you know and uh um and that is normal because obviously within the same uh, orders um, and there were different political orientations, there would be uh, different interests um, and we're usually talking about interests that mostly derived from strictly economical reasons, li like always uh, uh, whichever the, the environment in which they moved was, you know, it could be a city, uh, feudal domains, uh, it could be ecclesiastical uh, property, uh, etc. So it was very complicated because everything was overlapped. Mm. It's not that there was an enclosure for which every state, every princely state, thought on, on its own. It was a huge influence. And think about how, however, this um, produced civilization in turn. Because one thing is to be the sole ruler of a place, and everybody uh, kneels and everything's fine. But when you have to create order into chaos. You know, you you really have to draw from your best resources and abilities because otherwise you you can't you can't really play on it, and um, and, and and this is where German politics uh, started getting in uh, sneakier because obviously in such a hi highly fragmented political situation, the infiltrations of, of of other powers could 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 arrive from from many channels. Uh, and uh, and and you had to be aware of all the options. So um, that uh, obviously every situation was different. It had different characteristics, but still, the German kingdom was one, and German and, and was a, a, a politics at a national level that that had to obviously uh, a greater importance o over the um, the the singular local. Um, um you know matters so um um the mm, there is a turning point in this i would say which is probably the half of the 14th century be simply because at this point um especially with the <laughs> decline of the Habsburg um, that, that was balanced by the rise of the Luxembourgs in Bohemia. I dedicated a video about the Luxembourgs to, uh, in Bohemia. I'll go watch it because it explains also these things if you're interested uh, in, b in better detail. Um, probably there was a kind of um, mm, the increase of fragmentation in many ways. I mean, uh, families like the Habsburgs, the Luxembourgs, the Vettin, uh, the Wittelsbachs, uh, began to, um, from I in from their own local perspectives, to kind of give a a, a more solid balance to their domi domains, even though they were still largely unstable. But let's say that, especially with the arrival of the Luxembourgs, um, 
uh, as was saying, the, the, the Habsburg's power was resized, and the Habsburg power was the one that up to that time had tried to recover this Swabian uh, legacy, uh, politically speaking, as universal rulers. And at that point, uh, they gave up, also because there are major events of continental uh, dimension like the crisis and recession of the first half of the th 14th century that hits also in Germany. We know that a lot, especially the, the knightly class was grew increasingly poorer. That's why the, re the reason why they went, uh, for instance, in, um, uh, in in Italy fighting as soldiers of fortune. Um, and, uh, and especially there is the Black Death that obviously uh, wipes out considerable resources um, also in Germany so that uh, probably that also struck the ability of certain powers to wage uh, you know a, a kind of long rate policy and it, it, it definitely contributed to make uh, German politics more more local in many ways uh, you can see that from this the decreasing size of the um, and an impact of the German expeditions into Italy that goes in parallel with the decline of other powers like the Angevins uh, or the same papal um, power so it, it's, um, it's something very transversal at that point all over Europe um, and um, and there was a, a few, um, at this point, obviously, uh, the resizement over more concrete um, bases kind of knocked out um, certain other powers that up to that point uh, seemed to flourish, to, 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 I mean, to, a to be able to enter the political game of imperial power. Black Death destroys <laughs> a bit everything and only the stronger uh, survive. So the stronger in this were uh, the Luxembourgs and the Habsburgs. The, the Luxembourgs uh, were able to basically create a very strong centralized kingdom into Bohemia. Bohemia already being mm, substantially cent centralized in German, um, in uh, for German standards, uh, this Slavic kingdom within the. Uh, the in the empire had had a long tradition of um, of unity uh, as a single block, and as you can see here even from the map. Um, and the others were the Habsburgs that had seized, incidentally, um, what the Bohemians had conquered in southern um, in southeastern Germany, that was essentially Austria, Styria, and Carinthia, um, and that uh, had been occupied by the Habsburgs after defeating the Bohemians in the in 1278, and uh, and having you know a substantial base to to structure a power on its own. I, although the Habsburgs uh, at this point are split into dynasties that didn't um, didn't help them much. And um, uh, however, they were still a, a substantial force, even if divided. Um, and there are obviously many, um, many, r many cultural influences that Germany receives from the from the outside uh, at this moment. First of all, um, there is the injection of further um, French feudal um, uh, elements, especially in the same institutional model of the kingdom. In many ways. Um, this happened in part also because of the Luxembourg, uh, um, of the Luxembourgs being essentially of French origin, because there were French areas of the Holy Roman Empire, and uh, the Luxembourgs were, um, when they conquered Bohemia, they, they kind of, s of preferred to. Well, they really didn't conquer it. Th they basically were elected by the the, the same Bohemians, but. Uh, for for a long time, they preferred to live like in Paris or in their native lands, rather than Bohemia. That was, you know, a bit backwards compared to France, um, and the Luxembourgs were much more, you know, 
uh, attracted by the French model and that however contributed to, to even Bohemia itself com contributed to spread in turn the French models into the rest of Germany. Uh, France was at the peak of its power at this point so uh, before the Hundred Years War so it was obviously a, a model to be followed. But there is also the uh, widespread of the Roman right in the German lands that instead came from uh, the strong relations uh, that the kingdom had with Italy. Italy at that point was uh, at the top for uh, juridical studies, um, especially the University of Bologna uh, was, uh, you know, the, the most important um, juridical school of Europe, and um, and, and German kings at this point. Um, had also a lot of followers in Italy that had a strong Ghibelin bloc, especially in the north, and therefore they, they drew heavily from the uh, theorizations of the uh, Italian jurists that on the base of the Roman rite, which was independent by the uh, ecclesiastical one, was essentially stressing the, um, um, the, the independence of the imperial power um, of uh, the uh, fr from the uh, the papal uh, injuries that that obviously still existed um, at the time. Uh, very famous, uh, probably the the work that epitomizes the um, the uh, the imperial prerogatives is um, the Defensor Pacis, which means uh, the Defensor of Peace by. Um, Marsilius of Padua, a uh, very skilled uh, Italian uh, literate uh, and jurist, who, um, who basically wrote this treaty uh, for Ludwig the Bavarian. Uh, in fact, um, Marsilius would die in München uh, at the court of uh, Ludwig, um, uh, in which he stressed, pra he practically stated that everything that, that that the church had in, in terms of secular power was an usurpation. Um, so you can understand uh, you know, how that could turn useful to to the Wittelsbachs at that point that owned the, um, the imperial crown. Um, however, um, in a s uh, this great even cultural development um, was kind of masked the the overall political situation in Germany that really struggled to create something even, you know, uh, satisfactorily centralized and um, uh, and which had uh, very few territorial dominations um, wi with some concrete um, unity uh, uh, within themselves. So um, this will uh, situation really ultimately privileged the uh, the power of the uh, most powerful princes, and uh, there was obviously uh, within the um, um, at, an, at, at an institutional level the attempt to make parliaments, as we were saying, the this the so-called Landtag, Landtag in singular, um, that had. To, to put a bit of order in, in, into the empire that was still obviously recognized, um, but um, it was very um, it was a very weak power. Um, it was very difficult to control ecclesiastical uh, appointments that in turn had a very heavy effect on the politics of the empire because uh, think about the 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 three uh, ecclesiastical pri um, archbishops of Germany that were electors of the empire uh, themselves um, but it was also especially difficult um, to to structure the administrative and econo and financiary uh, structures um, uh, Germany sees also uh, like in other areas of Europe at this time like France or Italy uh, the rise of mercenaries Incidentally, even many mercenaries that were used all over Europe at this time came from Germany, um, because, as we were saying before, they, they, uh, the German lesser nobility had um, grown poor, so they, they would try to, to go fight somewhere wealthier, like uh, like Italy, where they, they were paying quite well in terms of money, and where the political instability could even bring to, you know, uh, the mercenary companies uh, making 
whatever the hell they liked um, there. Um, and this is, you know, a great moment of change in, in other ways. For instance, uh, the introduction of firearms during the 14th century brought definitely to favor uh, the most powerful territories because um, artillery costs a lot, um, so uh, it can be produced and afforded at least by um, by the more, f mm, you know, by the, w the wealthier powers. Uh, that in turn can conquer more easily other, pe um, you know, the, the, the smallest um, powers' fortresses uh, that couldn't withstand uh, artillery uh, in in a large part at that time, and that obviously favored the expansion of the uh, German princes and the privatization of, of power. Um, but it, it must be noted, however, that um, every kind of construction that was um uh, uh, you know political um dominion was developed in these centuries until the modern era in germany was um was extremely unstable you have to wait essentially uh at the end of the 15th century in order to have certain powers that um would remain secularly speaking with with a certain degree of stability um to to play you know into into the uh, political game, um, even the same Habsburgs that at the end of the 15th century rise to this huge power in Germany and they become to be reelected again as emperors. Um, kind of uh, could really wipe be wiped out uh, at a point um, up to the end of the 15th century. Not that afterwards uh, this couldn't happen, but. Uh, before the reunion of their dynastic branches, they, they could vanish uh, as a dynasty and instead they lived on into the modern contemporary era uh, changing the world um, as we know. Um, but this is true also for our powers at this point. Think about the Hohenzollern that rise uh, also there the, the in during the 15th century as Markgrafs of Brandenburg. And uh, you know, they they remained a minor power essentially until the seventeenth cent century. Um, and there are also other powers that kind of vanished, like uh, or that became minor uh, powers. Like Saxony was was strong at sixteenth century, but it kind of declined steadily uh, uh, in the other um, you know in the following years. Uh, Bohemia. Um, uh, basically passes eventually with the, the Luxembourgs die out and they pass into the hands of the of the Habsburgs then the, in the hands of the Hungarians so they ki kind of lost autonomous power um, um, and so on I, I'd say and there are even obviously in this mess that you can see here in the map I mean in infinite stories about who rose and uh, fell and um, etc so I hope I made uh, the point, um, I hope you enjoyed this video, um, as always if you liked it please share it, otherwise leave a like or, uh, or subscribe to my channel to receive further uh, contents. Um, as always I thank you very much for having the patience of listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time, bye!